Hi, Ken. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Quite well. Thanks for having me on here. Well, I'm delighted to have you on. I'm very excited about this conversation uh, because I love talking about the weirdness of modern physics. Um, and you are a modern physicist. Uh, you are Ken Wharton at the University of California uh, at San Jose. No, uh, San Jose State, State University. At, at San Jose State University. Okay. Um, which is right in the heart of Silicon Valley, right? It is, yes. Or, or the southern heart of Silicon Valley, I guess. Um, so, uh, and you uh, have become known for uh, arguing that something known as retrocausality is plausible. And, in, yes. Uh, and that uh, leads us to the larger subject of time and what time is. And physicists have some ideas about time that would strike most of us as being strange. Uh, sure. And I want to I want to try to introduce people to that if they're not already aware of that, and then get more specifically into your notion uh, that this retrocausality thing uh, could actually happen. And what that would mean is that events in the future could influence the present, or events in the present could influence the past. Now, it may be in a somewhat restricted sense that you mean this. We'll get to the senses in which you mean it. I'm not really sure myself how okay. uh, how uh, how vast the implications are. To avoid paradox. We, we don't want to allow paradox here. Yeah, well, although, I mean, doesn't physics kind of force us to confront the possible reality of paradox? Yes, we'll let you talk about that as well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, all bets are off when you talk about uh, modern physics. So... Let's talk, uh, and I should say, uh, I mean, it's a mainstream conception of, well, maybe, no, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. I should stop right there. Uh, but let's just, um, let's try to introduce people to one strange conception of time in modern physics, which they may have encountered via some mainstream movies like Planet of the Apes or Interstellar. Okay. And, and this is not retro causality, but it's just the idea that it's possible to, in some sense, travel into the future. Now, of course, as you've been known to point out, we know it's possible to travel into the future because you and I are doing that at a rate of one second per second right now. So what these movies have in mind is traveling at a rate of more than one second per second into right. the future, right? And and that is that's a fairly mainstream idea in physics that that is at least in principle possible, right? That's that's just an engineering problem. You just got to find a near light speed spacecraft, uh, build one, hop okay. on, travel in a circle, come back, and and, you'll... and you're there because there's this idea that for reasons I don't understand, uh, but this idea that when people travel really fast, this is comes out of Einstein Einstein's relativity. When people travel really fast, time moves faster for them. And relative to what they're moving uh, relative to. It's all relative. Right. Right? Relative to the people who are not moving with them. Right. I guess we wouldn't call these, we wouldn't say these people are standing still because in Einstein's universe, there are no absolute coordinates, right? That's right. So, But they are not, standing still relative to you. Right. And what breaks the symmetry in a circumstance like that is whoever accelerates back to the other one is the one who ends up younger. Um, if... <laughs> You went out on a light speed spaceship and didn't change direction. If somebody accelerated the Earth to catch up to you. It would actually be the Earth that uh, would uh, age less um, instead of you. So that movie, whoever, but that accelerate. movie has not been made, right? <laughs> no, that one, that one. I haven't seen that. People don't like to accelerate the Earth. To light they always speed. come back to the Earth, and it's the future. Right. And and just out of curiosity, do you have to get really close to the speed of light before this works at all, or or? <laughs> No, we, we've measured it to, from uh, clocks on, on spacecraft, but it's a very, very, very small effect. You can measure it with, well within the error bars. But if I, like, fly up into space and come back at any velocity at all, I, have I moved at least some distance into the future? Absolutely, and you can, that has been tested, and it, it is correct. Wow. Yes. But for it to be noticeable, you've got to be going pretty fast for pretty yes. far. Uh -huh. Yeah, at least 1% of the speed of light to really have any noticeable effect. Okay. Now, I have a question about this. It seems to me like maybe this isn't really saying that I can, you know, in, influence the future, right? Because, I mean, isn't it also, isn't this same Einsteinian, you know, notion 
uh, doesn't doesn't this frame of of uh, thought hold that basically the future is in some sense already there? I mean, what? yeah, it's it's real. The future is real. The future Perhaps. is real now. It's it's just that I have not traveled. So just as it's not experienced it yet, I They're haven't experienced experience. it. So it, it's like, and that's why when they talk about you know a four dimensional you know universe where time is a dimension. They mean that 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 there's this analogy with the spatial dimensions, which is that like if I travel to, you know, uh, Toronto today, if I set out today and go to Toronto, I will not know what it's like until I get there. But the fact about what it's like is already a fact, and, and I'm just I'm just discovering facts that already exist as I move toward Toronto. And in the physicist conception. Time is the same way. That dimension is already laid out. Yes, but there's a difference in that um, when, in the example you just gave, it's as if you're just discovering Toronto. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the future, we know we have a causal impact on the future. We can make decisions and see our decisions correlated with events in the future. And so it's not just a matter of discovering it, but even though it's, it's all real, the decisions we make uh, help shape that reality. And it doesn't. It's not a temporal process. It just um, is. You know, in this, the, you mentioned the Einsteinian perspective, where you have uh, space for, and time all laid out, mm -hmm. and in some some sp spatial analogy. And that's excellent as far as it goes. We tend to project bad things onto that analogy. But in that perspective, all of all events in space time are all laid out in this big block. Sometimes it's called the block universe. Okay, but. Is it really uh, a matter of consensus in physics that my decisions influence the future? I, I, had an, I had the idea that this kind of block universe where time is a dimension entailed a deterministic conception of the unfolding of time. In other words, the future is inevitable. Even if it is all deterministic, yeah. what, where the cause of uh, me lifting this pen comes from, this comes through me. And it comes through I... you. It comes through you, but it comes inevitably through you. Well, at some, at some level, it's useful to step back and imagine that whatever, even if it's a deterministic process in my brain, whatever that process is, let's just call that an agent. And uh, it's very okay. clear that this agent can choose or not to to lift this pen. Okay. And you can do experiments yourself to see that you have agency and you can cause the future. Even if there's an eventual explanation for that, it doesn't change the fact right. that I'm an effective agent that has effective causation over the future. Effective causation, but you could say the same thing about a complicated computer program that you don't understand and say, let's call this right. agency, even if in fact its output is inevitable. So right. we're and calling that, it an agent with, without actually passing judgment on the question of free will as it's commonly understood. That's right. And a computer can cause things too. And computers do cause things, right? They do, but what they are going to cause is inevitable. That is irrelevant to causation. Now, causation, you have to you step back yeah. to the level of whatever you want to call an agent. Um, that agent uh, can make decisions uh, yeah. or thinks, thinks it's making decisions. Yeah. And if those interventions in the world, those decisions have to be interventions in the world. If those are correlated with other events in space and time, we call that causation. Yeah. I mean, just I would just bracket the fact that to some philosophers, you know, there's a difference. Well, th that doesn't settle the question of, of free will, and you're not purporting to this, settle. The I'm not. I'm not going to settle right. that. This is a right. thousand-year-old debate, or many right. thousands of right. years. So, so um, okay. So that's uh, that's my working operational definition of causation. If just pick it something you call an agent, and for the purposes of argument, yeah. and that interve agent intervenes in the world, yeah. and you look for what else in the world is correlated with that intervention, mm -hmm. and you call that the effect. You call the intervention the cause, mm -hmm. and the correlated uh, parameters are the effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, uh, so forward time travel, in other words, faster than we're traveling into the future now, is deemed plausible by mainstream physics, and is part of a conception of the universe that, broadly speaking, you could call deterministic in the sense that the future is inevitable in this model, right? It, notwithstanding it's the role of so-called agents. The deterministic universe. Whether or not the universe is deterministic, if it obeys Einstein's equations, what you described is possible. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, the Einsteinian universe I'm talking about. Yes, right, right. Okay, now, 
let's get to this notion of um, causality flowing backwards through time, which is what you're, you're, uh, you've been uh, talking about, retrocausality. Okay. So, first of all, there's apparently an example of this in the famous two slits experiment. I don't know how far we want to get into this, but... That's, that's a great, great, great example. example. We should talk about A lot that. of people, have, well, it's great even aside from the backward causality thing, it's because it's, it's a textbook example of the weirdness of quantum physics to, be, to begin with, right? I mean, the, the idea... I, you know, the idea is so you shoot these electrons through through these two slits, right? And, and and on the other side of the slits, there's like a detector, like you know, some kind of paper or something that detects the impact of these electrons. And so, under some circumstances, you shoot them through, and the pattern you get on this on this measurement device, this whatever it is indicates that actually what went through, through the two slits went through in the form of waves because right. of a so-called interference pattern. For certain, for certain measurements. For certain exactly measurements. For but sometimes, for, in other circumstances, it'll, it'll be indicated by the measuring device that it was particles. Well, that, let, let me okay, move yeah. that down a little bit. It'll be what you, what I think what you want to say is it looks like it just went through one slit, which is more like a particle. Okay, so if you so do... Sometimes it looks like it went through two slits, and sometimes it looks like it went through one slit. Okay, let me be clear. So if you just fire it through one slit, it's going to look like a discrete particle. Is that it? Well, it, that's the funny thing. It always looks like a discrete particle. So say you have uh, a double slit or something like this, uh -huh. and you shoot uh, either one photon or one electron through. If the wavelength of the particle is comparable to the separation of the slits, and you look behind it, you still just see a dot. But you can do it again and again and again, and eventually what you build up on the screen is a, looks like a wave. It looks like an interference pattern. But if you put the paper closer, now you don't see the interference pattern. You just see it coming through one slit or the other each time. So you can choose to put the paper here, and that looks like it went through one slit each time. You put the paper back here, and it's like almost like it went through two slits each time. And now the question is, how do you interpret that phenomenon? Yeah. So, uh, because, because one of the cases might suggest to you that, well, really, there's a probability distribution of where the individual particle is going to go, right? You would, look at, the, you would look at the data and go, okay, well, all this means is sometimes it goes here, sometimes it goes here, and we can draw a probability wave telling you what the likelihood is. But then under the other circumstances, it looks like, no, wait, it's an actual wave, right? It's, yeah, it's not cool. just a probability wave representation of the likelihood of where the particle is going to be. It's an actual wave. And what, what would a probability wave even mean? Yes. Is, right. Is it's it an abstraction to describe a prediction, a, a, pro, a probabilistic prediction. Right. Well, anyway, so anyway, here's the thing. In reading up, in preparing for this conversation, I discovered, or possibly was reminded, that apparently uh, whether you choose to measure the particle, or maybe this is what you're saying, where you choose to measure yeah. what How comes through, yes. influences what form the thing was in when it went through the slits. In other words, a measurement after the fact, like if I wait until it's well past the slit to measure it and figure out, like, what does it look like, particle wave, whatever, the decision to measure it influences the form it was in when it came through the slit, apparently. Apparently. It certainly as seems that way. It gives that impression. You can't really see what it's doing at the slits without measuring it. So you have to kind of infer what it looks like it was doing back at the slits. But yeah, that's exactly the appearance it gives. Many people have said it is almost as if your future measurement choice is affecting, causing mm -hmm. that past behavior. And not many people want to go the beyond the as mm -hmm. if. But I'm actually willing to consider right. that maybe it's not just as if it's happening. Maybe right. that's what's really happening. And yeah. this is a matter of disagreement among physicists. Some, some would say, no, you're going too far. You should stick with the as if. Yes. But, you, but you're going um, mm. all the way, which is what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm, uh, I'm exploring all the way. You're exploring uh, all the way. And saying, well, uh, well would it be so, so bad? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, also, would it be so good in that maybe it might actually help us make sense of these weird quantum phenomena. I mean, there's some intuition we have that is wrong, right? Something weird is going on that doesn't seem intuitive. Uh, is it our intuition about time and causality? That, that could be the intuition that is at fault. 
Now, there's another uh, phenomenon I came across that apparently you've talked about that suggests retrocausality. It's called frustrated spontaneous emission. Yes. What is that? Uh, well, um, if you have an excited uh, atom or something that wants to decay into light, um, it usually does so. But uh, light's a wave, and waves inside cavities, some waves can't exist. They're, just, they're not stable solutions inside the cavity. And if you put an atom inside the right cavity... Um, that it wants to decay, seemingly, if it's not in the cavity, it suddenly doesn't decay. You, you prevent, the, the future boundary prevents this wave from ever existing. Um, and uh, one way to look at it is as if it, the future boundary is causing the past particle not to emit the okay. photon, and it doesn't. It doesn't emit. Now here's the way I heard it. I think this is on the BBC. Here's the way I read uh, that a journalist described this phenomenon, frustrated spontaneous emission. Tell me if this is right. An atom that normally emits light will cease emitting when its surroundings become incapable of absorbing that light? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, it's as if, well, there's two ways you could look at it, I guess. I mean, oh, you, could, yes. you could say it's as if the thing is uh, is if there's communication going on, you know, it's like sending out a signal to see if its environment is will be receptive to light, and if mm -hmm. it's not, then it's not sending any light out. But but you don't think? I mean, that uh, it seems to you that's not the way to interpret it. It really is the it is the fact that if it sent out, it's just the bare fact that if it sent out the light, the light would not be received. That keeps it from sending out the light in the first place. It is it is what would happen if it did something that keeps it from doing it, and it's not via some, the kind of like communication process I described. And this, this dichotomy you talk about kind of pulls us back into metaphysics a tiny bit, in that there are different ways to solve a physics problem. There's the typical way that most people are taught, and uh, the way Newton taught us to do physics, where you start with initial conditions, solve in time some, some equations, and, it, and the universe is like solving itself like a big computer, it spits out, spits out the answer. Um, but physicists actually have another toolbox that we use a lot, especially in fields like general relativity where time comes into play, where instead of solving it one slice at a time, you solve it all at once. You look at uh, a condition in the past, a condition in the future, and solve the problem not as a computer but as a big four-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. And the second option you mentioned is more aligned with this, uh, these action techniques that physicists use. The first one, you're, you try to get in this computer mode, but then you're like, wait a second, I have to now run the, run the computer backward, and you tie yourself into all sorts of uh, logical uh, conundrums if you do okay. that. Now, can you tell me, is this at all, this sounds to me, when I read that description I read to you about the, the light, emitting the light, I was reminded a little bit of that gravity, the original conce earlier conception of gravity and the so-called spooky action at a distance problem. In other words, it bothered people that, like, wait for the moon to exert an influence on the Earth. It's, it's like, wait, does the moon know the Earth is there? It's like, they're not in direct contact. It's one thing for two things to influence another when they make physical contact, but they're at a distance exerting an influence? Th that struck people as weird. It even struck Newton as weird. It, it, it struck even, Newton as weird. And yeah. as I understand it, Einstein's reconceptualization of the thing took the weirdness out of it in ways we needn't get into. But the, it, it filled in the gap. Yeah, it filled it, in the gap. Yeah, it made it more like... It, it, I gather that, well, if you think of it not just as a three-dimensional space continuum, but a four-dimensional space-time continuum, there's some sense in which stuff is just rolling along the landscape the way... There, yeah, there is no action at a distance in classical relativity. Okay. It's, it's mediated. It's okay. Mediated. So I was like reminded, am I crazy to be reminded of that problem when I heard about that this? Is, that is exactly the, the heart of, of the issue. It's um, when, when you're analyzing these quantum experiments and you have this, well, it's as if either there is action at a distance or as if it's retrocausal. Mm -hmm. You have to decide, well, the experiments don't tell us these Quantum entanglement experiments tell us, well, either it's action at a distance or it's retrocausal. Um, and so now, uh, the, since the experiments don't tell us, you have to weigh these, which, which is more likely. And most physicists come down to they, their intuitions tell them that it's better to have something that's action at a distance in quantum theory 
than something that is retrocausal in the sense I described. Okay, so this brings. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. But I'm I'm obviously willing to consider the other the other possibility. Clearly, and that's what we'll get to now, because uh, an interesting application of the idea of retrocausality is in what you just referred to as entanglement. So, for starters, we should explain what entanglement is. Let me give you my uh, oversimplified conception, probably, and you can tell me. But this is, we should say, this is something that freaked Einstein out. I mean, in fact, as I understand it, he said, look, quantum physics couldn't be the case, because if quantum physics were the case, then you'd have entanglement. But we've since, dis we've since pretty much confirmed, I gather, to pretty much everyone's satisfaction that we have entanglement. It's we have the so, strange phenomenon, yes. The, the strange phenomenon of entanglement. So here, so here it is. You, you have these two, I guess, particles that are initially in some sense paired. They're like okay. here together. They are okay. fired off in opposite directions. Okay. Um, you, they have a property. It's usually what's called spin. But for, to be simplify it, let's just say it's heads and tails. That if you measure one, you're going to find that it's either heads or it's tails, okay, mm -hmm. if that doesn't bias it too much. And the deal is that if you measure one when it's way, way out here uh, and it's heads, then that, in effect, forces the other particle to instantaneously assume the form of tails or the, the property of tails. I mean, with real spin, it's like numbers probably, so it's one and minus one or so, who knows, but... The point is, uh, there is what some people would interpret as instantaneous influence over a distance. Now, a layperson, what what's That's that? What math tells you. That's what the quantum mechanical math tells you. Tells you. But but Einstein, Einstein took that very same example and says, "Ah, oh, I have a much better solution. Mm -hmm. Why not just correlate the pennies at the beginning, so one is heads and one is tails, and then scramble them so you don't know which is which, and then when you separate them." Right. When you look at one, it's not that it suddenly collapses or anything. It's your state of knowledge about it was uncertain. Right. And that state of knowledge becomes certain, and immediately you update your knowledge about the other one, even if it's nowhere around. Right. You now know what the other one is. And this was the story Einstein wanted. He wanted some hidden variable. Right. So let's, so it update. Yeah. So let's pause and flesh this out to make sure it's clear. So in this scenario, it might be like Einstein is saying, well, look, here's what happened. You didn't know when they were together. The deal was that one was heads and one was tails, and then they were going to spin at exactly the same rate for eternity. So it was always going to be the case, naturally, that mm -hmm. when you look at one that's heads, the other one was going to be tails, but that just reflects the fact that you did not know. If you had known the facts of the case, their original states and the way they were spinning, there would be no mystery. There's no there's no communication. It's just that it's just that their their initial circumstances ensured that they would have their states would be eternally correlated. Right. And it's not that when you measure one out there, it influences the state of the other one. Now, quantum physicists tell us, mainstream quantum physicists tell us we can rule out that interpretation. Oh yeah, let's call that, that interpretation a um common cause, a past common cause, mm -hmm. uh and uh Hidden variable explanation. There's something mm -hmm. you don't know mm -hmm. that you learn about, mm -hmm. but all the explanations go back to a common cause. Yeah. So one of the most brilliant insights in, in this field is in the 60s, um, John Bell discovered that in the set of models that fall in that category of common past cause hidden variable models, there's a limit to how much correlation you can get. And quantum mechanics exceeds this limit. And so basically he proved that this simplistic, I just didn't know the state, but I later found out about it, and it's all forward causal, that doesn't work. Okay, so, and I gather there have been some kind of other loopholes. People have said, well, maybe this is what's going on, and there is a hidden variable, as Einstein thought, but slowly they've kind of closed off those possibilities, and now there's not thought to be much chance at all that Einstein was right. Well, that is the, the common story you will hear. Of course, you, logic, now this is when you come into the picture. The logic that leads you to that right. is you say, oh, let's, let's start with this story, and let's oh, assume, of course, there's no retrocausation, because who would consider that? And then that leads you to the story that Einstein was wrong, and that there's right. either spooky action at a distance, or there's 
uh, these things don't even exist in space and time, or that there's no reality, or some other weird conclusion. Right. But all that train of logic starts with, oh, by the way, we have to assume, of course, that there's no retrocausation. Okay. So let's talk... If you take the other viewpoint and say, oh, I assume there's no action at a distance. Right. The very same experiments actually prove retrocausation. Right. So you've got... You invoke retrocausation in a way that eliminates the spooky action at a distance, Although some would say at the cost of asserting something equally weird, yeah. which is oh, retrocausation. Much, much weirder, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so so what you're saying is that what happens... Wait, I'll get this wrong, but it'll be close enough that it'll be useful, and then you'll correct me. So, like, what happens is, like, okay, you fire the particles off, I measure one, and at that point, it's heads. And first of all, you know, there was not, uh, Einstein's wrong. There was not this initial, there was not already this initial correlation between the two. So, so we fire them off, and I measure one. And the act of measuring influences in retroactively that initial state. So it's, it, it's as if, it's as if when I measure it and it's heads, the fact that it was heads is sent back in time to the, a point when the two particles were together and the other particle like receives that information and then can make use of now and now now that I've measured it that other particle can make use of the information back in the present or future however you want to look at it when I'm making the measurement. That's that probably the easiest way to think about it but there are a couple uh, uh, different ways to think about it, I think, are more helpful. Okay. First of all, you want to start with hidden variables. If there's no hidden variables in the past, then there's nothing the future can cause, right? If, if there has, if, if you know everything. So Einstein, what? Well, okay, and, and we should say I, I don't think we quite explicitly explained what the term term hidden variables means. Well, in the context of your coin example, it would be you didn't know which coin was heads right. and which one was tails. That's a, that's a hidden and, variable. And more broadly, what it means is, okay, Einstein says, okay, in the quantum world, we can't predict the outcome. But that's just because there was some variable hidden that we didn't know. That's whereas, right. no, the average modern quantum physicist says, no, you're wrong. The principle is in, the future is in principle, in certain cases, unpredictable. There was never enough information to predict, even if we had known all of the information. So that's... Which, which is surprising to a lot of people learning physics, because the first thing they learn about quantum theory is the uncertainty principle. And then physicists turn around and say, well, actually, really, we do know everything. So there's a tension there between the original formulation of this uncertainty principle that says we don't know everything, and the modern interpretation of it, which says we do. Um, and there's yeah, so tension. Should we pause on that a little? I mean, the uncertainty principle was the idea, as I have read it, it was Heisenberg's idea that you can you can measure either the velocity or position of a particle, but you can't measure both because the act of measurement influences the thing. Like if you put the measuring device to a point where it just stops a particle dead, and you go, okay, it's here, you learn that, but at the cost of knowing the velocity, right? So in that scenario, there is a hidden variable. There, there is, is a, a exactly, yeah. exactly. There is in in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, as it's commonly explained, at least, it is it is uh, a totally predictable in principle situation. It's just that you can't have all the information because measurement obscures some of the information. That was how Heisenberg first meant it. Right? Okay, it's a, hidden, it's a hidden variable. Okay, argument. so go ahead. Sorry. Well, well, so then now we've reinterpreted that. We have. Uh, I didn't know that. So now the, the, the uncertainty well, principle no longer ago, means what Heisenberg... Physicists don't like hidden variables. Like quantum physicists don't like hidden variables. They oh, want to think we know the whole state. So they say Heisenberg was wrong about his own no, uncertainty you, principle? You reinterpret, uh, well, thanks in large part to people like Bohr who wrote uh, very confusing words to try to describe this. And so I will give you very confusing words to, to explain the okay. position. But it's not that there's, there's not a fact of the matter of what the hidden variables are. They're not only not known, they don't really even exist. Right. That is the standard tip. Okay. So we're, how did, how did uh, Heisenberg enter this? How did uncertainty enter this? You were explaining something else. Okay. So we, have, we do have hidden variables in a retrocausal account, or else there's nothing for the future to cause. So you basically gave the story. So imagine that the vertical okay. axis is time here, and the junction here is the, where the particles are created. Up here is where one particle is measured later, mm -hmm. and over here is where another particle is measured. You kind of gave the story where 
something happens here that kind of sends information back and it zoops over here. Mm -hmm. Now, that's kind of uh, maybe more time symmetric, but it's certainly not left-right symmetric, right? So you say, oh, why, why doesn't it go the other way? Um, and then you start to run into these problems, and the best way to deal with them is not to solve it like a computer running up and down, but to solve it all at once. Look at the whole V and analyze the whole entanglement experiment as one big jigsaw puzzle, constrained not just by the past now, but constrained by these future measurements. So think of it as a four-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. You know something about this, you know something about this, you know something about the bottom part, mm -hmm. and then you solve and find the solution all at once rather than as a computer. Okay, I'm not sure I got all that, but it sounds like maybe you're insisting that we analyze this within the block universe in a certain sense. I am. Uh, if you don't do that, you are actually secretly introducing a fifth time dimension. Right. Because you have time as this vertical axis, but right. now you have processes going on, so you're keeping a semblance of ordinary time that's not your vertical axis. Right. Spatial. So I was telling the story. Five dimensions, yeah. I was telling the story like a naive human being who's thinking in terms of conventional past and future, and you were thinking of it as in this universe where time is just another dimension. And so, you know, it's it's like uh, the the measurement, the fact of the measurement at time t plus one, is just a fact that goes into the whole thing. It's it's not like right. yeah, well, the, oh yeah, you want to distinguish the system you're talking about right. from what's outside the system, right. and what's outside the system here are the experimenters who are intervening and making choices at this corner. And then another experiment over here, making choices at this corner. But that's coming from outside the system we're talking about. We're not modeling people or computers here, right? We're just right. modeling a particle. Right. And remember my earlier definition of causation. If there's an intervention in the world that is correlated with some property, mm -hmm. that's what we call causation. And the intervention is the cause, and what's correlated with it is the effect. And so in this story, it's by definition retrocausal if you think they're hidden variables correlated with these future settings, uh, by definite, by my operational definition of causation, um, not mine, the philosophers have developed this, mm -hmm. uh, the intervention here is the cause, and the hidden variables in the past are the effect. Okay, so well, maybe the way that to, if I can persist in being the naive human being uh, here, the um, one question to ask is, are you saying Einstein was right? Uh, Almost. He was. I think he was a lot closer than um, uh, the other way of thinking about it, which is that um, there's either action at a distance or things don't even properly exist in space and time. In fact, in the, the framework, you've heard, everyone's heard the phrase, spooky action at a distance. Right. Uh, that was when Einstein wrote that. It was part of a longer sentence. And the earlier part of the sentence was, we're looking at something like, we're looking for a reality in space and time without spooky action and distance. And physicists uh, will pick spooky action and distance and throw out the reality in space and time, which leads to all these problems when you say, well, now we have these uh, quantum theory, how do you match it with gravity? The gravity mm -hmm. is a theory of space and time. You are not going to match them together. Mm -hmm. If you have a theory that's not in space and time, a theory that is in space and time, of course they don't play well together, right? Okay, so when I said my measuring the particle at like t plus one, in some sense, the information that I derive from the measurement, I described as uh, I described that information as like traveling backwards through time to the point where the particles together. At which point, the information can be imparted to the other particle. But you're you're almost saying the information was there. Well, so I think of it as an external constraint. So if you're yeah, standing next yeah. to a glacier and you see this weird asymmetry in the temperature, um, mm -hmm. the, the glacier is like this boundary constraint that you know, makes air cold there. And so you see, um, you see that as a special point, and you see that as expo in, imposed on the system. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think about the rest of the glacier. And the same way, these, we think of initial conditions in the same way. That, that's imposed on the future. That's, you don't have to think about what comes before. Right. You just start from the condition and run it forward. But if you're going to be symmetric about all this, and there's a, time symmetry is extremely important in, in physics, uh, then why not do the same at the end? So you have this boundary constraint at the end that's also a special point where these measurements are made, and that is constraining not the, just its future, but also its past. Uh -huh. 
Now, I guess in a way, uh, one reason I'm seeking the kind of uh, intuitive understanding of this, you know, trying to translate this into simplistic terms is because I'm also interested in the question of whether you're say, you know, what people would normally think retrocausality means is that you can actually change the past, but it, but it sounds like that's not quite what you're saying because you're you're basically within the framework of a block universe where time is just another dimension. So it's like, uh, no, sorry, the past the past is as determined as the future. You might say past is there. It's real, right? right. Uh, you know all of it. I mean, it, like I said, it has to be a hidden variable model. There has to be something you didn't know that you have the freedom to cause. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, given that extra piece, which plenty of people have imagined putting into physics, something you don't know, it's, it's easy to put in. Uh, if your future choices can constrain those parameters, it's retrocausal without a signal. This is very nice. You don't get retro signaling. You can't send a message to the past right. because what you're, what you're causing are the hidden variables, not the things you already knew. Well, this is a, a feature of entanglement in general. If we, if we, if we return to the spatial dimension, the, right. There's this irony that although you could describe it as one particle instantaneously influence another, you can't use that to send information. You couldn't use that to send information instantaneously because of what you don't know about the system until you measure it, basically. Right. So, and the nice thing about that is translated to our story, uh, the retrocausal story, that keeps you from signaling into the past as well. Mm -hmm. So if I'm thinking of this as like, well, you give up, okay, you solve spoo spooky action at a distance, but now you have spooky retro causality. I, that sounds to me, in a way, that's not quite right, is it or is it? <coughs> yeah, I think it is. Think it is um, right? And then it comes down to, uh, you know, you pull the average person on the street and say, um, would you rather give up uh, no action at a distance, or would you rather give up causality? And everyone would say, well, let's, I'd rather, much rather have action at a distance than retro causality. It just, that seems so much more crazy to us as, as humans. But that's because they're thinking of retro causality as meaning you could go back and change the past, and you're not really saying that. Well, they're thinking of something that would lead to paradoxes. Yes, perhaps. Perhaps that would be the reason. Or I think it's beyond that. I think our intuitions about time and causation are kind of deeper in our brain at a, right. at a, at a deeper, stronger, we're sure of this level at, than action and distance. I mean, there are people who I, I know who believe that you can have a premonition about a distant event, right? And yeah. that um, there are plenty of people that would accept action at a distance as some, some account for, right. for something or other. Um, but uh, fewer, well, I guess those same people might think you can know the future too. I don't know. <laughs> but, 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 but your retro causality is not a mechanism by which people in the future can be communicating with you right now. That's correct. That's yes. correct. That's disappointing, but true. Okay. Um, I, I, you can take oh, my theories and, and tweet them to make that happen. But you can't. Uh, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> if uh, you're, you're close to Hollywood, you're, you're a few hours drive from Hollywood. So maybe you'll be encouraged to tweet them. <laughs> um, but, uh, so let's, uh, let's talk a little about uh, just well, wait. Let me ask. Let me ask you. Let's talk about conceptions of time in physics generally. And one of them you referred to, which is that, uh, you know, although on the one hand, not a lot of people are out there uh, uh, advancing the retro causal cause, maybe so to speak. Um, it is a fact. People have noted that, by and large, the, the equations of physics are neutral with respect to time. I mean, you hear that phrase, right? And, and you, you use the phrase time symmetrical. And you hear this all the time, that like, there's nothing in the equations of physics that would make the future any difference from the past. And in a way, I guess that's just re-describing the block universe concept. Is that right? Well, it's, it goes beyond the block universe. It says if you have a block and you flip it upside down, then on a microscopic scale, you can't tell whether it was flipped or not. You can't tell. The laws don't change just because you flip it upside down or view it in a different order. Um, and this is bizarre to most people. This was a huge surprise in physics when this was discovered that the laws of physics were symmetric because that's not what we experience, right? We experience you know, wine glasses shattering and, mm -hmm. and uh, cream mixing into coffee. We don't, we don't experience a time-symmetric universe. So this was a shock. This was our first clue, actually, that our intuitions about time might not always be right. And is another way of saying this that just as in principle... 
even though we don't have enough information to do this, in principle, we could predict the future if we knew everything about the present state. In principle, if you knew the future, you could predict the present. Is that that's what we mean by time uh, time symmetry or? And that's a, I think a, a smaller statement than what I said okay. because what I said is also true in cases where you can't fully predict one from the other. But um, you're right that in a classical universe, in principle, if you knew everything at one time, you could predict everything at another time, and you could run it backward as well. So the prediction in principle goes either way, but of course the uncertainty principle trumps your ever being able to know mm -hmm. that information, in, even in a classical universe. Okay. Now, let me ask you a very strange question, I think. And this is inspired by the fact that I was just listening to a podcast uh, the other day about uh, Immanuel Kant. And mm, as, okay. I under, as I understand it, he, you know, he distinguished between the superficial appearance of things, the world we see, and the, the kind of the thing in itself, the real essence, the real stuff that we may not necessarily see. And I think part of the idea was that, like, okay, there's the real stuff, but we are interpreting the real stuff through these a priori assumptions of like space, things like space and time, right? Mm. So that's almost like we have these lenses that insist that we process things through these dimensions of space and time. But, mm. but that leads to a world that is in some respects, if not illusory, not, not the real fundamental thing. Now, does that make kind of makes sense from a point of view of modern physics? Uh, most people would say uh, absolutely that um, our uh, notion of space and time is uh, probably some emergent uh, phenomenon. There's something deeper underneath. And you would come to that conclusion if you started with quantum theory as currently formulated and just extrapolating it to space and time. And so most of the research in unifying particle physics and, and quantum with our best theories of space and time, that's their project. Their project is to find out how space and time emerges and saying it's not fundamental. But you can go the opposite way as well. You can say, well, actually, the general theory of relativity has actually been around longer than quantum mechanics. It's as accurate as quantum mechanics, if not more so, in its, in its domain. And so you can start with that and say, well, you know, this works really well. Maybe that's really space and time. Maybe that's what's there. It's a theory of space and time. And then you can go down my research project, which is trying to get all these quantum phenomena, entanglement, the double slit experiment, in a space-time based account. Mm -hmm. And um, the only way to do that is with retrocausation. Okay, but it seems to me even the, the world of relativity, even Einstein's world, is amenable to a kind of a Kantian interpretation in the sense that I think Einstein would say, you know, I'd go, look, I just, I'm sorry, I don't get this idea that the future is already out there and it's just a dimension, just the way if I followed, if I followed due north, I'd wind up in Canada and Canada's already there. I'm like, I don't get that. I think Einstein would say, well, that's just because of the way your brain happens to be constructed in this universe. You're not seeing the real truth, right? So, so in that sense, Einstein himself would be giving me a kind of a Kantian answer, He, right? And Okay. Uh, sure, he would say that just because we can't experience the future right now yeah. doesn't mean it's not real. Because something will happen in the next minute, I promise you. And only, only one thing will happen. And um, that, uh, to me, is just as real as what happened one minute ago. To a lot of people, they like to imagine that somehow it's, it's open. Right. Uh, and it, is, it should be open for our choices and our actions. We have to act as if the future is open. But... Um, to assign a different level of reality to the future than we do to the past is not consistent with what we know about physics. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder what he'd say if I asked the question like, is it possible that if my brain were engineered in a totally different way, I could have the opposite intuition? In other words, I'd go, of course it makes sense that the future it exists already, but I refuse to believe that when I walk north, and find Canada, that was inevitable. I, I mean, you know, it, I, yeah. I think Kant might say you can imagine an animal with a brain whose a, a priori assumptions were different, mm -hmm. and, and the into right? There's a science fiction movie coming out this summer, The Arrival, where if they hold true to the book, uh, the, the aliens will have a different conception of time than we do, yes. Uh-huh. Okay, well, I look forward to that, or backward as the case may be. Um, so, uh, 
Uh, you touched on free will. Now, um, I had a conversation with Lee Smolin on this very platform, and I'm yes. sure you're familiar with his work. Um, and as I understand him, he is advocating a conception of time that I think leaves room for true free will in some sense. I mean, he doesn't like the block. I think he doesn't like the block universe no, conception of time. But uh, and he and he doesn't. Uh, I don't know if this motivates his view, but I don't think he likes the fact that it's deterministic and seems to leave no room for free will. And he has a different conception of time that seems closer to leaving room for free will. Is that your understanding? Well, remember right at the beginning of the conversation, I made the point that even in a completely deterministic universe, free will is still, um, you can define an agent and it might think yeah. it has to. So, uh, there are a lot of philosophers who have been debating about this for thousands of years who, and I think over half of them are these things called compatibilists, that they say there's no, even if the universe is fully deterministic, it doesn't exclude free will. And philosophers who have thought very deeply about this right. come to the conclusion that free will is kind of almost a separate topic than all. Yeah, my but own view of... Block, block, block you. My own view, I mean, a, a popular treatment of that is uh, Dan Dennett's book, Freedom Evolves, or something like that. My own view of compatibilism, this idea that free will and determinism are compatible, is that it's word games. And it's not that... They're not giving us the version of free will that people really want to have. But people don't know what they want to have. I mean, do you want to have an uncaused cause as your choices? I wouldn't want that. I want, to, well, I want my causes to be deliberated, right? Yeah. Well, people, uh, yeah, if, if you probe them, they do want an uncaused cause. I, I mean, that, well, that. No, you don't want your choices to be random and caused by nothing. You want them to be caused by your, your dis conscious decision right. process. Right. On the other hand, I mean, it's true that the only things we can conceive, we can conceive of two kinds of causes in principle. We can conceive of, or what, two kinds of, well, universe. We can conceive of uh, caused causes and a, and a chain of those and a chain of nothing but caused causes is determinism. And then we can, well, we can at least conceive of true randomness. I mean, we can at least, actually, it turns out to be hard to conceive of true, true randomness. Yeah. But the fact is, most of us would say, okay, I'll, I'll grant you there could be true randomness. Um, it's, I think you're... I, I think most people, by free will, think they mean something that's neither of those two things. And, and, and it could be, I mean, they could be right in the sense that it could be a limitation of the human mind that the only two things it can clearly conceive are caused causes and random, truly random causes. Oh. And, and, it, and, and the fact that I can't, if you press me to like sketch out on paper what I mean by free will, the fact that I can't do it yeah. or even clearly articulate it could be a limitation of the human mind, right? Sure, but what I'll suggest is a lot of people get sidetracked by the irrelevant question of whether I can choose a random number. Um, and I don't care whether I can choose a random number. What I care is that I can choose to uh, type a sentence. Uh, I can choose to do something I deliberate on. And that's the only kind of free will I care about. I don't care whether I can choose a random number. And then once you get into the, the deliberative choices, you will quickly conclude that you do not want your deliberations to be caused by random things. True. And again, most people don't say that that's what they want when they say they want free will. Yeah. Okay. They want something that's neither caused nor random, and then you ask them, "Well, what is that?" And they go, "Well, uh, well, you know, I can't clearly say, okay. but I'm just saying that there are there could be things that we can't clearly describe that still exist. After all, you wouldn't expect a human brain that is a product of natural selection to actually be able to grasp all of reality. I mean, that I, I mean, isn't that kind of what quantum physics is showing us? That like it doesn't make intuitive sense. It. it it seems what, paradoxical. No, no. What quantum physics is showing is one of our intuitions is wrong. That's what quantum physics shows us. The question What's the is... The intuition that there shouldn't be paradox. <laughs> um, I, no, I... Because I, uh, then you have to throw out all of math as well. We, want, we don't want to throw out all of math. Um, what we want is uh, to, to analyze our intuitions, not from a gut level, which mm -hmm. intuitions do I think are strongest, but rather from an evidence level, like any scientist would analyze any proposal. And when uh, the experiments tell us that we have a wrong intuition, um, at that point, sometimes some physicists just throw up their hands and say, well, I'll just go with my gut. Um, but we shouldn't do that. We should, we should be good scientists. We should analyze our own intuitions and say which ones are more likely wrong, which mm -hmm. ones mismatch the, the evidence we have around us. 
And uh, we've already mentioned that we have discovered the surprising fact that time, the laws of physics are symmetric. That is a mismatch with our intuition. We then, Einstein comes along and says there's not even a, a now. There's not even a, a objective line of now. That's all. That's Wait, all there's not a now? I didn't realize he said that. So this well, mind, um, so mind, this mindfulness stuff is the opposite of the truth. There is no now. I the the the, the uh, and in fact Lee Smolin, his conception of time, he said the only thing that's that's well, no, he said the past is true because it happened, but it's not happening now. Now is true because it's now. I think he said this. You're saying now isn't true? Well, now is it's like here. And now it's just like here. Every every uh, time I've ever experienced it seemed like now at the time. Yeah. And um, it they're not they're not special. There's no moment that's more special than another because every moment I've ever experienced is now. Um, and so uh, everywhere I go is here. Uh, here's not an objective thing, and neither is now. It's not an objective thing. Okay, let me uh, the uh, to get back to this question of whether there might be things that are true that we can't conceive. Here's something that I think quantum physics asserts that I find it hard to conceive. Isn't it an implication of quantum physics that there are things that happen in the physical universe that have no cause in the physical universe? Right? Like sometimes like a particle will decay in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. This is another way of saying that Einstein was wrong. It, it's not all hidden variables, right? The, the, so there are things that happen in the physical universe for which there is no cause in the physical universe? Um, it certainly looks that way for, for if you just run through the math. Uh, you run through the math and you have this moment in the calculations where you have to calculate probabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the math it gives you no evidence for, um, for whether A is going to happen or B is going to happen. Right. But uh, in a hidden variable account, uh, that's not necessarily true. Right. Uh, because the math would be incomplete, right? The math would not be, would not, there would be missing some hidden right. parameters. I mean, by definition, it's not true in a hidden variable account. The whole idea of a hidden variable is there's always, there's always a cause in the universe. It's just that we don't always have enough information to predict. I, actually, I'm currently exploring models that both have hidden variables and retrocausality, and there's not, uh, fact of the matter of what's going to happen. I mean, there's all sorts of permutations. Okay. Um, we shouldn't lock ourselves into just a couple boxes. Uh, there are, you can add hidden variables or not, you can add virtual causality or not, and you can have globally deterministic models that if you knew all the boundaries, you could solve everything. Or, um, I mean, we have lots of physics that that isn't true. In statistical mechanics, given all the parameters, you calculate a space of possibilities, and you pick one, and you say one happens, and if you I ask a physicist, why is the particular configuration of air molecules in this room just the way it is? It's like it doesn't matter. It's just, it had to be something. And so it's one thing. And there are plenty of theories that fall in that category. You do not have to check the determinism box to recover okay. anything. But I gather it is the view of mainstream quantum physics today that things happen in the universe for which Without, there is no cause in the universe, right? Right. And that Although is, I, just came, I just came back from a conference where uh, many people may take this many worlds view, where um, there's not a fact, even a fact of the matter about uh, right. what happens, well, and they all happen in some sense. Let's, let's talk briefly about many worlds. I mean, I want to pause and reflect on this idea of something happening in the universe for which there's no physical cause in the universe, because that's an example of something. I mean, when I say our intuitions may not be up to reality. If the mainstream quantum physics view is correct, and you, again, you're saying it may not be, but if we accept what is today the mainstream quantum physics view of the universe, it just violates my intuitions because I can't imagine how something could happen for which there is no cause, right? Uh, but that's just, the mind is a very mechanical thing, you know, and, and, and yeah. it, 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 it likes, anyway. So let's, Let's briefly talk about many worlds because I know in some of your discussions of uh, the time problem generally and maybe retro causation specifically, you get into uh, many worlds, which is, and again, I'll, I'll give you the simplistic conception. You can tell me where I'm wrong, but it's the idea that uh, according to quantum physics, I guess there are these like, you know, branch points where like, it's like, well, is the pro is the is the proton going to decay in this direction or that direction, whatever? There are these things that 
seem like true uh, randomness. And are these the branch points in many worlds where one interpretation is that, well, what happens is a whole new world is given birth to. And so in this world, it was heads. And in this world, it is tails. And, and every time there's a branch point at this microscopic level, a whole new universe is created or something? That uh, is effectively um, how it might look, but these people are just taking the bare math of quantum mechanics literally. Right. And actually, um, they would probably say, well, even before you looked, there were many worlds. And then after you looked, there are still many worlds. But now what is linked to what we call our world kind of splits apart. Um, and uh, when, like, let's go back to the double slit experiment. So when you see this interference pattern, uh, if you just send one particle through, you don't see the interference pattern. You just see a dot. Right. right. You have to build it up. But they would say, after even a single particle goes through, that whole wave is somehow there in some larger dimensional space. Mm -hmm. And we are just seeing this tiny little part of it, or we just see one dot. But there maybe is another observer uh, in some other part of this giant space seeing a different dot. And so that way they get around this uncaused effect, in a sense, because everything still happens. Right. And now you have other worries about how everything happens. Is that coherent? So maybe, that, maybe, the way, maybe the way to say, so, so we, we referred to a probability wave earlier, and there is, so here the idea is that if you ask yourself, well, what state will this electron or some particle be in when I measure it? All you can say is, well, the chances it'll be in this state are X, this state are Y, this state are Z, and, and together those constitute a probability curve. Right. And then you'll measure it, and only one will be the case. But is the many worlds idea that actually all the possibilities represented on that curve are the reality in yeah. some world? It's not, it's not a four-dimensional world, though. It's uh, the dimensionality of the space they need instead of living in three space and one time dimension, live in, uh, let's see, at the conference just now, uh, we were told it was two to the 10 to the 122 dimensions, plus one for time. Wait, that's roughly the number of worlds there are? That's the number of dimensions you need uh, to describe the many worlds reality. Not four dimensions, it's two to the 10 to the 122 plus one. But they do think, don't they, that there is some real sense in which there's another world in which there's another version of me that traveled down a different path. Well, um, in a, uh, if you had a piece of paper, I could draw different one-dimensional lines and say, well, there's one world and here's another world, but it's all part of the same two-dimensional block. In a four-dimensional block, you can draw different uh -huh. curves. In a two to the 10 to the 122 plus one-dimensional block, you can imagine there are a lot of ways to parse it up into four-dimensional pieces. Mm -hmm. And depending on how you slice it up, you might say, ah, oh, that piece corresponds to an observer who sees this. That other piece corresponds to pretty much the same observer who sees something else. And in such a huge dimensional space, it's hard to even visualize what you mean by reality. Uh -huh. But in any event, you don't buy many worlds. Well, you're... Kind of the, what leads you to many worlds is, is a very attractive notion of just taking the math literally um, and saying. In other words, taking that probability curve seriously. Yeah. Like it's and not it's not just the probability that a given prediction is correct. It is the reality. The, the at this moment, the particle is assuming all these different forms, so or all these different states. And and in all these higher uh, dimensions, to the extent they do correspond to our spatial dimensions, mm -hmm. parameters that correspond to here are correlated with parameters that correspond to here because they're connected via this higher dimensional space. And so you get basically spatial, spooky spatial correlations for free in this story. Mm -hmm. And the one correlation you don't have is that at any moment in time, it's uncorrelated with how you're going to choose to measure it at the next moment. So they have all these correlations in space and no uh, spooky correlations in time. All I'm saying is if we add the spooky correlation in time, you instead of needing two to the 10 to the 122 dimensions, you only need three. And I think it's a good trade-off. That's a real dimension saver. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Congratulations. That we're back to a universe I can comprehend. If, if retro causality does that, I may I may uh, lend it my support. I'm gonna I'm gonna 
I want to reflect on it before I give it my official endorsement. And I know <laughs> that'll get you a long way if I endorse retrocausality, but I may be heading this, in that direction. This summer, uh, there have been quite a few papers from uh, uh, various sources endorsing, at least looking into retrocausality. It's not uh, just uh, a few dozen people. So now it's, it's like three dozen people. So it's in some sense a competitor with many worlds. In other words, the two solve to some extent the same problems in different ways. Uh, they are solving. They're they're recasting what the problems are. Uh, but yes. Okay, but I mean they're they're, res they're responding to puzzles. They are alternative responses to puzzles. Yes. And. Uh, Okay, and yet at the same time, I mean, Many Worlds has picked up a bit of support in the last oh, few years, it's right? Very, it's very, very popular. Which just seems uh, like nuts. It's, it's 60 years old, but yeah. it's, uh, it's very popular. Final question. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I've heard various descriptions of how uh, quantum computers work. And of course, they're all put in lay terms because I wouldn't be able to understand the math. But one explanation I've heard made me think that, well, maybe the, the fact that quantum computers work lends a little support to many worlds in the sense that it almost sounded like what, what was happening was, right? Like, according, if you take this probability wave literally and seriously, it's not just a predictive device, it's the reality that there's an electron, that, that the same particle is simultaneously assuming these different states. It seemed to me that, like, quantum computing was harnessing that by saying, yeah, so let's get each of these different versions of the electron to do some computational work simultaneously. Is that, is that, in which case you might think, well, maybe Many Worlds is right. If they, if they can, if these different the versions yeah. of a single electron can do work simultaneously, mm -hmm. then they all exist and the probability wave is not just an abstraction. So that's, that's an interesting argument uh, about uh, less than a year ago, I read a paper with a different argument saying that, well, you know, these, these quantum algorithms give you a speed up over the classical algorithm. You can do it faster. Mm -hmm. And this, this uh, guy uh, from Italy, uh, whose name escaped me at this moment, wrote a paper um, saying, well, how could we explain the speed up? And one way to explain it is with many worlds. But he discovered that another way to explain it is if you gave the algorithm half of the information about its final output, in a scrambled form that you couldn't get anything out of. But it, if the algorithm actually had access to half the data in its own output, you also get a speed up. And in every case he looks at, it matches the speed up that quantum computers give you. And so there are other ways to explain the speed up. Okay. And one of the other ways is actually retrocausal. Whoa. I'm glad I brought that up. Um, so there you go. Well, uh, I just want to uh, wish you luck in your retro causal cause. Um, let me mention. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I did want to clarify that uh, unlike many worlds, uh, uh, the retro causal community does not have a complete model. At this point, these are um, arguments, proof of principle cases to show that it will work in this special case. Mm -hmm. But um, there are few enough people working on it that we do not yet have a complete model. So if somebody is looking for a uh, new and exciting research project, um, this is an open field. Okay. I think I'm a little old to take it on. And plus there's my lack of comprehension of basic math and physics, but there may be someone out there who can lend you a hand. Meanwhile, let me, well, let me tell such people where they might look in the meanwhile. So um, you and your colleague, Hugh Price, does he pronounce the first name Hugh? H-U-W. Yes, that's right. Uh, wrote an essay called Dispelling the Quantum Spooks. There are PDFs of it on the internet. You wrote a piece we didn't have a chance to talk about called The Universe is Not a Computer. Yes. It sounds kind of ironic. But we did talk, talk about it. I gave, when I gave the story, you could either solve it one time, slice at a time, or solve it all at once. That's what I okay, talked about. Okay, that's your that universe way. is not a computer argument. Okay, there's that. And then there are a couple of uh, journalistic pieces, one on the BBC website called The Quantum Origin of Time, which uh, I think mentions you, and I think so does this piece in Nautilus called The Quantum Mechanics of Fate. The Nautilus one, uh, oh, oh, The Quantum Mechanics of Fate, that's George Musser, right. Correct. Yes. Those two mention me. I, I have a piece in Nautilus with you, Price, uh, in a more recent issue, um, uh, in, my, in my own words. Uh, okay, uh, so that's uh, in addition to the piece by you and Hugh Price that I cited. Yes. Okay, so what? So 
What's that called? What's that one called? Um, uh, it was in uh, issue 36 of Nautilus. I can't remember the title. Okay. Well, people Google Nautilus in your name. I'm pretty sure they'll... Yes. Uh, they will have luck. Well, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to to get this stuff as clear as it can reasonably be expected to be. Given its well, thank history. you, thank you for your interest. There, um, retro causality has had had some sporadic interest, uh, but I think uh, in recent months and years, um, it's get, starting to get the attention that uh, it deserves. As a, you know, it might not be right, but um, okay. Should we explore it? Uh, absolutely. I encourage young physicists to jump on your bandwagon. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ken. Thank you, Bob. All right.